Christine Smith. Pardon? Okay, just making sure you're ready for the state to proceed. Yes. Okay. Uh, when you are ready, Attorney Gotti, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, as you know, the defendant has been found guilty of beating Harmony Montgomery in July of 2019, guilty of murdering Harmony Montgomery, a child under the age of 13, and then transporting and hiding and abusing her body and compacting her into smaller and smaller bags and ultimately disposing of her on March of 2020 and tampering with witnesses afterwards to ensure that this horror story that we heard at trial stayed silent. Under our law, after the second degree assault, after what he did to her and the other crimes to hide our other acts to hide his crimes, under our law in New Hampshire, that means that the mandatory minimum sentence that the defendant must receive for second degree murder of a child under 13 is at least 35 years in prison. So the question for us today isn't why the defendant should get the minimum mandatory sentence. The question is, how can the minimum sentence ever apply to the crimes that were committed by this man? How can the minimum ever apply when he beat Harmony the night before and the morning of and time and time again as he drove from the methadone clinic to Burger King and he beat her to death? and then covered her up to suffer and die in the car while he ate his food. The state's position is how can the minimum ever apply when this court recognized at the last sentencing hearing that he had 15 years of convictions for, quote, some of the most violent and egregious criminal behavior, end quote, that this court had ever seen. How can the minimum ever apply when he's lied over and over again that he didn't kill his daughter and that she was safe somewhere when he was first asked by many different people? How can the minimums ever apply when he conceded at trial the crimes that involved the horrors that he inflicted upon her body from December 7th on forward up and until March when he dumped her from the U-Haul that he had conned others into renting for him? How can the minimum ever apply when he's had opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to tell investigators and others where she is right now and she can't be laid to rest? There is nothing minimal about the crimes that he's being convicted for today. Um, the state is not going to restate everything that's put forth in the state's sentencing memorandum word for word. The state's recommendation at this time is that the defendant serve four to eight years, stand committed, for the crime of second degree assault, which occurred in July of 2019. And that that should then be followed by consecutive sentences of three and a half to seven years for his falsifying physical evidence for what he did to Harmony's body with a concurrent sentence of 12 months for the abuse of corpse misdemeanor, followed by another consecutive three and a half to seven years for witness tampering, for beating his spouse to ensure that she would stick to the story he created followed by not less than a minimum of 45 years to life from the charge of second degree murder. The state recognizes that this is just a recommendation. The decision today lies with the court regardless of what the state says. But that's the state's recommendation today. However, Your Honor, if the defendant will right now tell us where he hid her body, sufficient for us to find her, if he'll tell us right now where he put that CMC bag so that her family and the Manchester Police Department can recover her remains in the next seven days, then the state would amend its recommendation to a minimum of 35 years to life and let the second degree assault, falsifying physical evidence, abuse of a course, and witness tampering sentences be served concurrent. But right now, Your Honor, if he tells us where we can recover her and we do so within the next seven days, we will change our recommendation to 35 years. Since that offer has been rejected, Your Honor, that is yet another reason why the minimum should not apply. What I just said was not a stunt it was not a theatrical event. I stated in closing arguments 
that there are moments in life where we are tested, where our failure or our success lies and whether we do the right thing at that, at that moment in time. And time and time again, and about 30 seconds ago, the defendant chose again to be heartless and immoral and selfish and unapologetic, which for the purposes of you deciding his punishment and rehabilitation and his deterrence and coming up with the right sentence for him means that he has just yet shown you again in this courtroom and for anybody else that he is heartless, immoral, selfish, and an unapologetic murderer of his own child. Now, as I was saying again, there's certainly nothing minimal about what he did to Kayla Montgomery, to abusing her into lying for him. There's simply nothing minimal about what the defendant did to Harmony and what he did afterwards. And that's why now, having just given an, an opportunity, we're asking you to impose nothing less than 45 to life for the sentence of homicide. You should impose, impose more. But 45 is a bare minimum that this defendant deserves for what he did to Harmony. She is gone forever. She didn't get sick and get old and pass away. Something didn't just happen that night. He happened. She wasn't able to be surrounded by the people that loved her. And instead, when this court determines punishment, deterrence, and rehabilitation, it should consider that Harmony died in pain and in fear under a blanket and nobody deserves that, especially a five-year-old child. And that kind of death is different in ways in favor of more than the minimum sentence here. You can, if there was a, a thief here, you could order the return of stolen property or you could order restitution. When you sentence a defendant for an assault case, the victim can receive treatment and compensation for her injuries, but in a murder case, there's nothing directly that this court can do for Harmony. She's already ultimately paid the price of the defendant's anger and cruelty and frustration. But what can be done is recognize the value of her life and the terrible way she died by giving the defendant a significant prison sentence, something more than just the minimum, and certainly not the sentence that the defendant may ask you for in a few moments. You can make sure that he's not going to hurt another child. You can do that for Harmony. And in that process, you'll also be doing justice for the people who cared about Harmony, for the many people that worked hard to hold her killer accountable. Except most of those people, several of them, are in the courtroom today. Many more are out there. Some who are present here today would like a chance to address the court, Your Honor. Most notably, and I think has to be first and foremost, Your Honor, is Harmony's biological mother, Crystal Sword. She's present here today. She has prepared a victim impact statement that we have written that we can provide to the court afterwards, but we would like her to be able to speak to you and present her thoughts. She may do so. To the monster who murdered my baby. I did not kill my daughter, and I look forward to trial to refute those offensive claims. That is all you have said about my sweet daughter's life. Another lie, like all the other ones you've told. Like the cover story you told, that you dropped her off with me, knowing full well and good if you had, she would be thriving right now. not beaten and stuffed in a CMC bag where you put her. She had a life worth living, unlike your own, and it bothered you to your core that she was nothing like you and everything like me. Beautiful inside and out, funny, smart, sassy, loving, and most of all, kind. She wasn't a coward like you. And I'll be forever grateful for that. You're a coward who has to be in control of everything and everyone around you. Insecure and paranoid. The list goes on. 
she is none of those things. She lit up a room when she walked in. She made a mark wherever she went, and you couldn't stand it. She was an incredible big sister. She loved her brother, Jameson, to her core, and I know she loved your sons, too. No matter the picture you tried to paint of her. December 7th will forever be the darkest day of my life. The night you beat her to death, I woke up in the middle of the night in agonizing pain. From my head to my toes and I felt like I was dying, not knowing, in the most brutal way, a part of me was dying. Suffering in that back seat for 20 minutes while you and your wife fed yourselves and your other children, and you got high. 20 minutes that you could have used to save her life. Did she cry for me? Did she scream? Did she beg you to stop? I'll never know. Because like I said, you're too much of a coward to tell the truth and do one good thing for Harmony. You may have taken her physically from me, but she is always, always with me. And I will forever look for her until the end of my days. But I hope that every day and every night you are on this earth, you hear nothing but my baby's giggle. I doubt you ever heard it in this life. All she knew with you was misery and fear. I hope you hear a sweet voice telling you to stop hitting her over and over. Or how she looked the very last time you saw her, broken and bruised. You were supposed to protect her, yet you did the opposite. Harmony wasn't anything to you but property that you could throw away when she was more of a burden to you than a meal ticket. Your hatred for me led you to act on your monstrous, controlling ways, and you, look, you took her because you just could not let her come home where she belongs. My love for Harmony outweighs my hatred for you, but they both gave me the strength to listen to my instincts and to help the police put you away forever. Harmony will live on through me, and you can't do anything about it. You can't do anything to stop it. I wish you nothing but pain and misery for the rest of your pathetic life. And with or without you, we will find my daughter. I always knew you weren't a good person, which is why I left you. I just never knew to what extent. But now I know you're just plain evil. To the most, most vile human on the planet, the day Harmony was born is the day that will forever feel like it was just yesterday. My sister was in labor and you were in prison, always keeping you posted. I remember that phone call with you right after she was born and they were both in the recovery room. I was talking you down from how scared you were because you just wanted to be the best dad. And I believed in you and reminded you how good you were with my daughter, that you would be the best dad and not to worry. I couldn't even believe how wrong I actually was. You are a monster, Adam. Not the monster who's in your nightmares or the ones that terrify you when you're little. You're the monster that pretends to be a daddy. And then brutally abused, tortured, and beat your five-year-old daughter to death for the accidents you caused by locking her in a room 24-7, traumatizing her, and making it blatantly clear that she could not trust, count on, or come to you when she needed someone. You didn't fight for her for four years like you had Kayla claim on your behalf. You lied, and you f forged documents. You did it to have control again over something in my sister's life. You never for one second loved Harmony because if you did, she'd still be here today. You wanted to control her and when you couldn't over and over again because she reminded you of my sister, you took her from us because you didn't want anyone else to have her. More proof of the absolute coward you are. 
the fact that you sat in court at your gun trial, like my sister said, and tried to use harmony for some sympathy by saying you cannot wait to refute the offensive claims that you killed your daughter and you did that you didn't and you loved her. Jury selection day, you showed up smiling at the jurors, proving exactly how evil you are. Then tell the judge the day of opening statements that you did all but kill you did all but kill her and expect a bunch of people to believe yet another lie from you. Because your egotistical ignorance makes you believe you are somehow smarter than anybody. You have the nerve to claim to be a victim of the disease of addiction and how it destroyed your life and all the crybaby stories you tell. The fact is this. You are a selfish, evil, conniving, poor excuse for a human being, and I hope you sit in prison every day while she haunts you day and night until it's unbearable because that's what you deserve. I used to call you my brother. We used to talk about everything. I've seen you break down and cry and open your heart up to me. Even when you first got Harmony, I messaged you and I told you that I would help in any way if I can if you needed it for Harmony and wanted to be a part of her life. And just like anyone else you, that reached out, you blocked me. You had so many chances to change the result and let her go with people that loved her, but you didn't because you knew you, she would tell, she would have told all about the abuse, so you killed her. If you're any type of man at all, Adam, or you ever loved her for one second, you would tell us where she is, so at least she can rest in peace after everything you put her mind, body, and soul through. Regardless, karma will get even because you don't destroy such a beautiful soul the way you did and not reap what you sow. So may it be. Excuse me, that is the victim of the crime of witness tampering is Ms. Kayla Montgomery. She has prepared a statement we have submitted there. We will be submitting that to the court as well. It has been provided to the defense counsel. She has asked uh, a victim advocate to please read the statement for her. If the, if the victim advocate could please state her name for the record uh, and also uh, the Kayla Montgomery's statement. Certainly. My name is Amy Van Aken, and I'm reading a statement on behalf of Kayla Montgomery. Goodbye. I wanted to write a letter to you because it's the only way to tell you how I feel. I don't know about you, but I need some kind of closure. I will forever have a place in my heart for you, whether you believe me or not. You were my best friend, my husband, the person I chose to spend the rest of my life with. You were the father of our children we have together, and I'm forever grateful for having them. I will never forget the birth of our first son we have. That was one of the many best days of my life. We had just gotten married and started a family of our own. I'll never forget when your grandmother said to me, you're the best thing that has ever happened to my grandson. I'll always remember the births of all the children we have. Also, when you stepped up to be a father to Harmony. You worked so hard to get custody of her and it took a few years, but you got her. I won't forget the day we picked her up and brought her home. We were so excited. Then, during the summer, was when we both started to go downhill because of relapse. After five years of sobriety, that was the beginning of the chaos. By the time Thanksgiving came around in the year 2019, we were losing everything. My job, our place to live, and after living in a car for a few weeks, we lost that. At the same time, Harmony dies because of your anger and hitting her so many times. We didn't even know she passed away until the car died and we had to take our kids out of the car. She didn't respond, she was lifeless. Then a couple years go by, and during those years, we had to keep quiet about her being gone. You told me to stick with the story that you dropped her off at 6 a.m. at Duncan's, where I no longer worked at, and brought her to her mother, Crystal, so she could stay there because it was better for Harmony. Then you came and picked me up when my shift was done at 2 p.m. She wasn't in the car, she was with her mother. During those years of having to keep quiet, you started physically and mentally abusing me, accusing me of cheating on you, telling on you, and trying to kill you. The first time that you really hurt me was when you accused me of cheating and had me on the living room floor against the corner of the wall telling me if I didn't tell you that I cheated on you that you were going to F me up. When I never cheated on you and said that I didn't, you punched me right in the face a couple of times because you said I was lying, and I wasn't. So then I said, yes, I cheated on you so you wouldn't hit me, but you still did anyway. You started getting crazy when we would get high on crack. 
I told you I did things that I really didn't do because you said if I told you that I did whatever you'd accuse me of that you wouldn't hit me and I was dumb enough to believe you. No matter what I said or did, you would hit me, punch me, spit in my face, or would have me in a chokehold and cover my mouth so I couldn't scream. You are not the person I married, not the person who loved me and who never hurt me. It's like I married my father. I never would have thought I would have to run away from you until I knew I had to take our kids and leave you. I'll never forget that day either. It was one of the hardest things for me to do. The last couple of nights after you got arrested the first time, I was sleeping with a knife because I did not know what you were going to do to me. After I found out that you got arrested, I went back to our apartment to grab a few things, and then I made the decision of not going back to live there anymore. I couldn't stay in the apartment after a year of chaos with you in there. Just all bad memories, barely any good ones. We had about five months total that year of living there that were good times. Other than that, nothing but nothing but bad memories. I'm so angry and hurt by you. I know you probably hate me because I had to do the right thing, but also because of all the bad, not only did you lose your rights to our children, but so did I. Now I'm going to have to keep fighting for them to at least be back in their lives. You seem to forget you cheated, not me, and you just left the kids and I for some girl, packed your stuff, and left to another state. I called you out on your BS when you are on your way to Maine, and I also called you out for being with someone else months before you left to Maine. You accused me, but you were the one cheating. The day you got arrested on January 2022, you called me and said to tell Kelsey you're sorry about her car. Yeah, right. That's all you're worried about, not your wife and children you may never see again. No apology for cheating on me and making me think I was crazy. So I got to do all I can to get back on track with my life. You caused so much hurt and pain. I don't even know why I still care about you and actually feel bad for you. Oh, maybe it's because I'm not a cold, heartless person and still have some care about you. I was in love with you once. Now I still love you because you're the father of our children. This is goodbye for now. Maybe I'll see you at the future in some point. Goodbye, Adam. And then she lists the day they started their relationship was October 8th, 2015. And um, the day they married was Harmony's birthday, June 4th, 2017. Your Honor, one family member who I've heard from yet is with regards to uh, a very young man. This is Harmony's younger brother, Jameson. He was lived with Harmony up until the age of one, saw her as late as 18 months in his life. Both of his parents are here, uh, Mr. Blair Miller and also Mr. Jonathan Bobbitt Miller, and they have a statement they would like to present. Your Honor, thank you so much for allowing us to speak here today. Good afternoon to you. My name is Blair Miller, and my husband Jonathan and I are here today on behalf of our son, Jameson, who we adopted in 2019. He is a seven-year-old boy who came to us from foster care. Jameson and his sister, Harmony, were in and out of different foster homes together. They seem to be on a path of surviving their troubling relationships, their circumstances together. To understand the true impact that this loss has had on Jameson and will continue to impact him, you need to hear the stories he tells us and wants you to know. He wants everyone to know. When we first adopted Jameson, he would always tell us about Harmony. He would tell us about her beautiful blonde hair. He would tell us about her glasses. He still does. He would tell us about her bright blue eyes. He would tell us about her wonderful smile that lit up a room. He would tell us that she was there to help him. Jameson has constantly asked us, where's Harmony? Recently, he once was struggling to go to bed. He looked off in the shadows of his closet and said, is that Harmony there looking back at me? These are no questions for a little boy to be asking. He no longer can hold on to that hope. Since learning about the death of innocent and beautiful Harmony, Jameson has suffered. Just a few weeks ago in school, his teacher asked him to draw a picture of his family. He drew a picture of his two dogs, his two brothers, his two dads, but then he put a heart above all of us, and inside that heart was the letter H. He said that was Harmony looking down on us. Jameson constantly asks us, who took my sister away? Adam, 
You took away his best friend, his sister. You introduced murder into his life and forever created a void that can never be filled. We will never have the right answers for him on this and can only tell him Harmony is an angel now. Jameson will grow up forever wondering how this happened, how his sister, who looked over him in foster care, didn't have anyone looking over her. You chose, Adam, to take our little boy's sister away. You don't ever deserve another choice in a free society. Your Honor, we are asking you to impose the maximum sentence. Your Honor, this courtroom, and especially Adam, I'm Jonathan Bobbitt Miller, and I'm the proud adopted dad of Jameson Miller, the proud young brother of Harmony. Harmony is the reason that we're all here today. Harmony, the child Adam, that you murdered, you introduced a nightmare into our son. You introduced evil of this world to him. You have manipulated the criminal justice system until now, and trying to explain that to our seven-year-old son is hard. Before Jameson knew of Harmony's tragic fate, he would go to the door when the doorbell rung, and he would say, maybe she's found me. He would search a park, he would look at school, and if there was any girl that had blonde hair and glasses, he would go up to them and say, are you Harmony? I'll never forget the day that we told Jameson that Harmony was in heaven. He was a very, he's a very active kid, and that day he just stopped, and he held us, and he said, no, I need my big sister. Why? Why did this happen? These are questions that Jameson has had and continues to ask. Daddy and Dada, what happened to my sister? Why did she die? Why would anyone hurt her? How about her glasses? Were they okay? My God, we will, how will we ever help him process this horrible and brutal details of his big sister? Adam, you have to know you did that. As we celebrated Jameson's birthday in 2019 with the Mickey and Minnie Mouse theme, we had Mickey Mouse there. It's a Disney theme that he shares with his big sister and his mom. He wanted to save a gift from her that day made from his Nana. It was a Minnie Mouse pillow, but instead you were beating her to death. That was the same day. If Jameson was old enough to speak to this court today, he would want you to know the void that you left in his heart that can never be filled. Adam, he would plead with you to please tell us where she is. Let him have a place to go and remember his sister, please. He remembers her feeding him. He remembers when they would be at a, his foster home when she was there, that they would play in the park together. He remembers her glasses. Uh, he remembers how proud she was. How do we tell her seven-year-old that you murdered his sister, his protector, his best friend, and you showed no remorse? I wish they could be happy together today. Jameson asks, is she unhappy in heaven? If she can see him, and if we can visit her, why would anyone hurt her? That's what you've done to her son when you beat his sister to death. In her family, we really believe in love and forgiveness. I'm just not sure how to teach her son how to forgive the monster that murdered his sister. We as, are, we as a family are leaning on God for that. Jameson also knows about the helpers. He knows about this court. He knows about the jury. He knows about the police from the local to federal. He knows about this community. We've told him these were the people that helped his sister when she was hurting. I'd like to share with you a few words that Jameson, as we were talking to him, because he wanted to know, where are you guys going? What are you doing? And I said, we're going to speak for your sister and we're gonna tell everyone how important she was to you. And this is what he said, tell everyone my name is Jameson. I'm seven years old. My sister's Harmony. I love Harmony. I miss her. I hope I get to see her again. My sister had beautiful blue eyes and we smile alike. 
I liked having fun with her on the playground. She gave me a broken Elmo toy that was hers. I still have that. But I have the Minnie Mouse pillow and a new Elmo that's not broken. I keep it in my closet for her. I'm really sad she's an angel. I miss her. She was my best friend. I hope she can see me playing basketball, being silly with my brothers. And I wish I could bring Harmony to my school to meet my friends and my teacher. <laughs> she loves the color purple and Minnie Mouse. <sighs> I made a heart for her in purple and red with mirrors so I can look for her in heaven. I hope she sees me. The red is for my heart and the purple is for her. I love my sister. I miss her. I hope she's eating M&Ms in heaven. I hope her glasses are safe and not broken. And I miss you, and I will always love you, big sister. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, finally, with us today is Harmony's foster mother, Michelle Rafferty. Now, Harmony was alive for 66 months in this world. And for 44 of those months, she was with the Rafferty's, Michelle and her husband, Tim. They've both prepared a statement as well. We would like to speak with you today. Your Honor, I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak here today. This is truly the hardest thing I have ever had to do. My name is Michelle Raftery, and along with my husband and my five children, we have the privilege of being Harmony's foster family. We shared our hearts, our home, and our life with her, and she filled our lives with joy and laughter. We lost a daughter, and my children lost their sister. We grieve for her every day because we thought we'd always see her again. Harmony was full of life and always happy. We jokingly told her that she leaves a sparkle wherever she goes. She loved to be in the middle of everything that was going on, and she never missed a beat. Harmony always had two mummies, me and Crystal, but only had one daddy, and that was my husband, Tim. I am beyond grateful Harmony had the relationship with a loving daddy and knew what that relationship should look like. She loved being a sister and had an amazing bond with our youngest daughter. And when our second daughter had her baby, she was delighted to be an auntie. Harmony was a friend to everyone, but she also had a best friend named Dominic. She loved going to church and loved going to school. She loved Minnie Mouse, playing outside, playing dress up, playing house, and loved to cuddle. She had a large community that she loved and they loved her. She was kind and compassionate and always willing to share even her Oreo cookies and favorite doll stroller. Since everything came to light, I have had trouble sleeping and concentrating. We had to explain to our children things that we never wanted them to hear and explain to them why a father who was supposed to love and protect her was being arrested for murder. Your Honor, I'm asking you to give Adam the fullest sentence. Adam is hateful and selfish and continues to be so by not telling us where her body is. Adam knew he could have brought Harmony back to us. He had options, but always chose himself each time. He never put Harmony first. There were consequences for his actions, and he will have to live with them the rest of his life. Our family is strong and beginning to heal by the grace of God. We know Harmony is safe in the arms of Jesus, never to be hurt again. So despite the evil brought to light in this trial, we will continue to move forward in love because love wins. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, in addition to those statements, the state is asking you to consider not only all of the details and the facts that you heard during trial, um, and not only um, as you would for any defendant, their criminal history, uh, of which is laid out there and which this court is already well aware of, but we are also asking the court to take into account two additional charges which are still pending. A firearm that was belonging and was owned by a Mr. Yule and also a high point handgun. 
These are two charged but not yet adjudicated offenses that can be considered by the court when it comes to sentencing. We did not ask you to take the defendant's murder of his daughter into account at the last sentencing for the other firearms, given that it had occurred before her death. But these two not yet tried armed career criminal charges, offenses for weapons, belonging to Mr. Yule and the high point handgun should be considered to show that the minimum does not apply to this man. The court is already aware of the defendant's statements to many other people, whether they, many other people through many different facets of his life with regards to being asked where his daughter was and for him to lie to them. Um, this was subject to many different uh, interpretations. The court has discussed this on different events, different times, excuse me, and different hearings. With regards to those events and with regards also to the gun crimes that I speak of, Mr. Yule's firearm and the high point handgun, um, we feel that the state has already shown uh, the requisite level of certainty that the defendant has done these crimes. He's been indicted by the grand jury. We've discussed them. Parts of the evidence that support them have already been presented to the court. But we have also uh, asked for Detective John Dunleavy to be present from the Manchester Police Department who can provide additional information if the court so chooses to hear that. Um, so at this point, I would leave it up to the court's discretion uh, if and when the court should be considering those two charges as part of coming up with the appropriate sentence for the defendant today. But he is here in the courtroom. All right. Thank you. I, I don't feel that I need to hear from him at this juncture. If the court feels it necessary to hear from him, I will do so later. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, one of the things that you saw during trial were the many different ways in which the defendant tried to conceal his crime, not just physically, but also with false statements and lies to others. Lies as to where she was, as to what had occurred, where it had occurred in the car, where he was at the time. Um, even lies, as you heard from some witnesses, as to whether or not he loved or cared for Harmony in the first place. You heard and saw the defendant try to sell his lies to anybody that would listen. And why does that matter? Because it's one thing to deny the charges that the state then, and hold the state accountable to bring forth proof beyond a reasonable doubt, but it's another one to actively lie and deceive and blame others. And a defendant who does that, like this defendant did, is different and is deserving of more than the minimal punishment. You've even heard yourself how the defendant tried over and over again to get Kayla Montgomery to lie for him. The testimony we heard at trial included the verbal threats to her, beating her, photographs that we saw of her black eyes, testimony from other independent witnesses of him either hurting her or her running away, being injured, or grabbing a cell phone out of her hands and manipulating her even months later to get rid of telephones that had evidence of the crimes on them. You've seen those bruises, you've heard those stories from independent eyewitnesses. That was not just an attack on her, that was an attack on our system of justice. And to hold him accountable for that independently, consecutively, to the actual underlying crime of the homicide and the second degree assault from before. As you've seen in this case, if we don't do that, if we don't hold people accountable for those actions afterwards, then the criminal justice system is failing because it allows defendants everywhere under the concept of general deterrence to think that they can tamper with witnesses and destroy evidence. And if they're caught, well, it'll just be subsumed by the underlying crime. That's another reason why the more than the minimum sentence is necessary. And finally, I'm not going to go into full detail on it, Your Honor, but you've seen in the state sentencing memorandum, there are three cases that are on point and when looking for, for comparison here. And those are State versus Caitlin Marin, State versus Mark Heath, and State versus Chad Evans, all cited in our sentencing memorandum. In those matters involved individuals who were convicted of reckless second degree murder for injuring children. And all three of those individuals, either immediately after trial or at sentence review, all had sentences that were in their 40s. And all three of those people didn't have the criminal history that this defendant has. And all three of them didn't do afterwards to their victims and what they did to their bodies, what he did to harm them. So in the state's mind, how can the defendant here get anything less for that? His behavior is worse. When we look at that, 
if and when he should ask for sentence review after today, if they look at that, we don't feel that there's any way that they could equate that his behavior was less than theirs or that his punishment should be less than theirs. There's nothing about this little girl's death or her suffering or what her father did afterwards that can ever be classified as minimal. He is still determined five years later that she have no peace, no justice, no rest. So the state is asking you to do what justice requires, and that's nothing less than the state's recommended sentence. Harmony deserves it, her family deserves it, the people of the state deserve it, and definitely this defendant deserves it. Thank you. Thank you. Attorney Smith? Thank you, Your Honor. I'd like to start reading from State versus Willie at 163 New Hampshire 532. We held that just as it is unconstitutional to increase a defendant's punishment because he refuses to admit guilt, so too is it unconstitutional for a court to draw an adverse inference of lack of remorse from a defendant's silence at sentencing. Because the only affirmative way for a defendant who maintains his innocence through the criminal process to express remorse at sentencing is to forgo his right to remain silent. Using a defendant's silence at sentencing to infer that he lacks remorse generally violates the defendant's constitutional privilege against self-incrimination. The state said that their offer to reduce or uh, offer a reduced sentence of 35 years if Adam Montgomery took particular action within the next seven days and his reaction to that reflected heartless, immoral, no remorse. You can imagine, anybody can, that somebody walking into a sentencing hearing for something where he maintains his innocence that he did not do would be a difficult situation. That person would be assisted by his counsel who would understand that being vilified for something that you didn't do would be difficult, who would understand that when people are trying to throw him away forever for something that you didn't do would be difficult. And the state was doing a stunt. They were seeking a reaction today from Adam Montgomery in the courtroom by their stunt for something that they said, give us seven days. And then Mr. Montgomery acting appropriate with his counsel's representation was called heartless, immoral, and no remorse. Mr. Montgomery does not have to express remorse here or something where he maintains his innocence. It would violate his constitutional rights against self-incrimination. And talk a little bit about uh, the use of priors as argued in the state's memorandum to elevate what is a sentence as a mandatory minimum that is extraordinarily high, and it is high because any time a child dies, it, an innocent child dies, deserves a strong punishment. And the legislature has spoken with a mandatory minimum of that punishment. The lack of rehabilitation is what the priors are put on for. I don't think anybody can permit a what another person would be like after 35 years of incarceration. To assume the lack of rehabilitation for prior records that occurred from the time that Mr. Montgomery was quite young, that many fueled by drug and drug addiction that was introduced to his life by some of the very witnesses, family members, wives who participated in maintaining his addiction and in a lot of the conduct that he did 
in the prior record. He is worthy of rehabilitation, especially after what would be the mandatory minimum under this sentence. The use of the remaining charges also are inappropriate here. Uh, you considered, you did not consider the um, charge of homicide at his prior sentencing on the armed career criminal charges that he faced uh, May a year ago. But you did consider the armed career criminal charges, or at least you didn't indicate that you didn't, and the state certainly argued that they should be considered as well. Uh, all of that conduct occurred in a relatively short time period, and while we dispute the probable cause, even the law says that you can consider the grand jury indictment as probable cause, which I think is completely inappropriate, but that is the law. However, his sentences on armed career criminal took into account both his prior and his um, subsequent char gun charges. He's serving a sentence currently of what comes to be about 32 because he got 15 as a minimum on one, 15 as a minimum on another. Uh, the five years of the seven year minimum on the final charge that you sentenced him on, uh, you suspended two years. Didn't even totally give him the max on that, but certainly increased his sentence in your evaluation of his prior conduct as well as the pending gun charges. Another issue I need to address, and I'm afraid we only addressed part of it in chambers, my fault, uh, the names of the no contact order. I don't have, so we don't have a position on that as far as the names. However, since the state has asked for an incarcerated sentence on each of the charges, I don't believe a non-contact order can be issued on the charges under interpretation of current law. However, I will say that the names will be provided to Adam, and I can assure this court that Adam will not seek any contact with the Sorrel family. So, sorry, sorry, family. Uh, so, what do you do for sentencing Adam Montgomery? Adam Montgomery does not dispute the time sought by the state for abuse of corpse and falsifying evidence. The state has requested maximum sentences on that consecutive, and Adam does understand that it infect, affected the investigation and that that behavior affects justice in the court system. And he does not dispute the sentences requested by the state on that. However, while he maintains his innocence, he also knows that you will be sentencing him on the other charges because he has been convicted, and any other action he takes will have to be after sentencing. So as to the other charges, while he maintains his innocence on each of them, he can't offer a sentence because no sentence would be fair for him to say that they would be fair when he is maintaining his innocence and he did not commit those charges. So he can't offer you something that's appropriate for them, but he would request that you take into account his objections to the memorandum and especially his silence here at sentencing uh, as being an appropriate position to take when he is asserting his innocence. We request that the court issue a sentence that is less than what the state has asked and that it make the remaining charges 
concurrent with abuse of corpse and falsifying evidence. Adam Montgomery did not kill his daughter, but when he discovered his daughter's death, he broke, and he did inexplicable things. Even he can't explain his actions. But eventually he pulled it together, and he was able to say goodbye to his daughter, and that's what he did. So I may have a moment, Your Honor. Yes, you may. Actually, my co-counsel has reminded me of something, and again, this was something that was not in the sentencing memorandum, and it was last minute, and it is the stunt that was pulled by the state, and it is that uh, plea offers, responses, negotiations are inadmissible, and I think that they are inadmissible for any purpose, including sentencing. Certainly, I know in other cases, if I was to say the state offered something pretrial and now they're seeking twice that, the state would shut me down under that rule, which four times, four times. So I think that entire stunt should be stricken from the record as well. Briefly, Your Honor, I made no such comment about plea offers that were made prior to trial in any way, shape, or form. When I called the defendant heartless, immoral, selfish, and unapologetic, and in doing so, it's about the two crimes that he has admitted that he has done. It's the falsifying physical evidence, <coughs> and it's the abuse of corpse, which he admitted and even told the jury that they could find him guilty of. Those are the ones relating to the placement of the body. There's no reason to hold on to that piece of information with regards to that. The statement is not offering anything because this completely lies within the hands of the court. The statement is to make the change of what the state's recommendation would be. It's not an offer of a guaranteed sentence in any way, shape, or form. And again, it's on those charges, the one where he does not maintain his innocence anymore. Falsifying physical evidence and abuse of a corpse. I think just separately, Your Honor, with regards to the victims that the state is asking for the no contact order, that would include Crystal Sorey and her family, S-O-R-E-Y. That would also include the Miller family, Your Honor, and that would be Harmony's brother's family, and as well as the Rafferty family. I can provide those spellings to the uh, court monitor afterwards. I think those are the only additional things that the state wants to add. But, Judy Gotti, what do you say to the state VTOL issue that's raised by the defense about the no contact order on, a, on stand committed sentences where all of the sentences that you're asking for in this case are stand committed, uh, but you're also asking for the no contact provision? Um, Your Honor, I think with regards to that, uh, rather than to prolong this particular hearing, the state would then also ask for a $5,000 fine on each felony for that to be suspended for the period so that the no contact order can be obeyed during that time period. And if he violates the no contact order, then that could be imposed. Suspended for what period? Um, I would say for suspended for a period of, well, on the two Class B misdemeanors, I would say suspended for at least a period of seven years uh, upon the beginning of that serving of that sentence and for the uh, charge of second degree murder, I would say beginning on the, t uh, for a 20 year time period, uh, beginning when he starts serving that sentence. Do you want to address that, Attorney Smith? I'm, I, I'm just thinking about that for a moment. I mean, Attorney Agati, on that, the the consequence of a violation of the order would be the imposition of the fine. That's correct, Your Honor. Okay. For clarity in sentencing, um, I think 5,000 is illegal for any one of those charges, although certainly combinations of certain charges can equal that amount. Um, 
I think it's six of one, half a dozen of another, because as I said, with regard to the family, uh, Crystal Sori and her family, Mr. Montgomery will not be reaching out to any of them. All right, thank you. Council approach for just a minute. All right, nothing further from the state? Nothing further, Your Honor. Thank you. Okay. Nothing further from you, Attorney Smith? No, Your Honor. All right. Uh, I'm going to take a 15-minute recess so I can uh, consider all of the information and statements that have been provided, and then I'll come back and uh, announce my sentence. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. All right. The crimes that you have committed and the harm that you have caused cannot be overstated. You took a human life and you did so in the most callous and heartless of ways. You robbed a five-year-old girl, your own daughter, of the life that she was to lead. You stole from your sons a sister. You took a daughter from her mother. You were convicted of reckless second-degree murder. Reckless in this context does not mean something that was an accident. It is defined under law as something <clears throat> that manifest the extreme indifference to a human life. Your extreme indifference to the value of human life is seen in so many of your actions in this case. In 2019, you beat Harmony. In the words of your uncle, her, file, her eye was fully black and blue like a raccoon eye, is what he said. Your words, when asked, were, quote, I bashed her around the effing house and then you hid her from the view of others and you kept her from those that came to help her. On the date that you murdered her, you didn't hit her once, you punched her in the head repeatedly. You beat her in the car while at stoplights more than one time. You knew that she was severely injured, yet you covered her with a blanket and didn't check on her until after you took her lifeless body from the car. And then after her death, you treated her body like it was trash worse than trash. You did unimaginable things to her body, and all in an effort to save yourself from being discovered as her murderer. And then, on top of that, you threatened, abused, and beat your wife to keep her silent. Your criminal history similarly reflects your extreme indifference to the value of human life. Your actions having taken both a physical and emotional toll on so many. In 2008, you were convicted of criminal threatening after pointing a knife at a 15-year-old girl. In 2010, you were convicted of armed robbery and assault and battery with a dangerous weapon in a home invasion incident in which it was reported that you held up a woman at gunpoint, terrorizing her to the point that she lost control of her bodily functions. 
In 2009, you were convicted of first-degree assault for stabbing another person. In 2014, you were convicted of assault and battery with a dangerous weapon and larceny in a case in which it was reported that you shot a man in the face. In 2019, you were convicted of two counts of armed career criminal, two counts of theft, and two counts of receiving stolen property, all of the charges stemming from the thefts of firearms, guns, exchanges of guns for drugs and money. The court has to consider three primary goals of sentencing, punishment, deterrence, and rehabilitation. The focus today is on your convictions in this case. Second degree murder, falsifying physical evidence, witness tampering, abuse of a corpse, and second degree assault. But the prior convictions are important. And they're important as well as each of them reflects not just your extensive criminal conduct, but each of them represents an opportunity after sentencing for you to have changed the trajectory of your life, to change how you were treating other people. But you were either unwilling or unable to do so. And as a result, at this point, the court has the responsibility to impose a sentence that not only punishes you harshly for the crimes that you have committed, but considers deterrence, that is, how to keep you from hurting others. In light of the egregious nature of the crimes of which you have been convicted in this case and taking into consideration your extremely violent criminal history, the court finds the only way to do this is to keep you off the streets. To the extent, to the extent you seek to rehabilitate yourself, you, that will have to happen behind the prison walls. Harmony was an innocent five-year-old girl. You treated her in the worst of possible ways in both her life and in her death. Therefore, the court sentences you as follows. On charge ID 2027112C, the charge of second degree murder, you are sentenced to the New Hampshire State Prison for not more than life nor less than 45 years. That sentence is stand committed. That sentence is consecutive. Uh, all of these sentences, I should say now, are consecutive to each other. Uh, as well as consecutive to docket 216-2022-CR-577, which are the, uh, the sentences that you're currently serving. Additionally, uh, you're to participate meaningfully and, meaningfully and complete any counseling, treatment, or education programs as directed by the correctional authority or probation parole. Uh, law enforcement agencies may return evidence to its rightful owner. You are ordered to be of good conduct and comply with all the terms of this sentence. Uh, this is also consecutive to the second degree assault charge in the docket ending in 2-0. Uh, that is charge ID 1937947C. Do you have any questions about that sentence? Nope. On charge ID 2027113C, falsifying physical evidence. On this charge, you are sentenced to New Hampshire State Prison for not more than seven years nor three and a half years. The sentence is stand committed, consecutive to all of the other charges that I'm about to read you, as well as uh, consecutive to the second degree assault charge and the docket ending in 2-0 and the sentences that you are presently serving. Uh, you do have the obligation, uh, as with the other sentences, to meaningfully participate in programming as, direction, as directed by the correctional authority or probation parole. You're ordered to be of good conduct and comply with all the terms of that sentence. On the charge of tampering with witnesses and, infor and informants, you are sentenced to the New Hampshire State Prison for not more than seven years nor less than three and a half years. Again, these sentences are this sentence is consecutive to the additional sentences uh, that I've read to you and that I'm reading to you in this case, as well as docket ending in 2-0 and the sentences that you are presently serving. Uh, you have the same obligations for, um, for participation in programming and law enforcement may return evidence to its rightful owner. On the abuse of corpse charge, uh, on this charge, you are sentenced to the maximum penalty of 12 months at the House of Correction. All of this sentence is suspended for 25 years. If it were to be imposed, it would be consecutive to the sentence, sentences that I read to you. 
And on this charge, you will also have the provision of a no contact order, uh, and that is no contact uh, with the Sori family, the Miller family, and the Rafferty family. That sentence is also consecutive were it to be imposed to all of the other sentences in this case and the sentence you're currently serving. On the second degree assault charge, charge ID 1937947C, you are sentenced to New Hampshire State Prison for not more than eight years nor less than four years. These sentences, this sentence is consecutive to the sentences in docket 216 2022 CR 2372. This is charge ID 1937947C. Uh, on this charge, you have the additional uh, requirement, as you have in the other cases, to meaningfully participate in programming. Uh, law enforcement agencies may return evidence to its rightful owner, and you're obligated to be of good behavior and comply with all the terms of the sentence. Do you have any question about those sentences? No, I do not. All right. Before you go, counsel approach, please. Uh, the sentences that I just reviewed with you, Mr. Montgomery, are imposed in light of the extended period of incarceration. The court will also make the finding that you do not have an ability to pay your attorney's fees, so there will not be an obligation for those in these matters. Uh, the clerk will now address you regarding sentence review. Mr. Montgomery, you are hereby notified that you have the right to apply for review of the state prison sentence imposed on you on May 9th, 2024. The application may be filed within 30 days after the date of the sentence, but not thereafter except for good cause shown. If you file such an application, your sentence will, will be reviewed by a board of three members who will be either judicial referees and or superior court judges. Review of the sentence may result in a decrease or increase of the minimum or maximum term within the limits fixed by law, or there may be no change in the sentence. A form for making application, if you wish to do so, is set forth below. Mr. Montgomery, this applies for both cases, 216-2022-CR20 and 216-2022-CR2372. I'll leave those with you. Thank you. Do you want to sign your name? Yeah. Anything further from the state? State. Thank you, Your Honor. Anything further from you, Attorney Smith? No, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.